Uh, so welcome to our webinar, um, Check Perspective on Decent Partnership, the second event in the sequence organized with support from the International Visegrad Fund within the framework of the project Advancing Reforms in Armenia with Visegrad Falls Know-How. So we will have two more events in July. And so that would be the first module with presentations by experts from all four Visegrad countries. And from September, it's uh, dealing in general with Central European countries policies and particularly the Eastern Partnership. And from September, we will start four other modules on civilian security sector reform, healthcare reform and social policy, renewable energy sector development, and IT sector governance and information site development. Unfortunately, uh, today, uh, we planned that some members of the parliament would join us, but uh, they have yet another snap session. So Hopefully, some will join us at the next event on Friday. And now, without further, further delay, I would like to invite the Deputy Head of Mission of the Czech Embassy in Yerevan, Mr. Jan Pleschinger, to address the participants. Thank you very much. Could you, uh, could you hear me, please? Uh, yes, I can hear. Um, first of all, uh, uh, two apologies. Um, uh, the, the technical issues uh, in our office does not allow uh, to use the Zoom, so I use my mobile phone. So I hope that uh, <clears throat> I will be loud and clear. Uh, and secondly, apologies uh, on behalf of uh, Ambassador Kopetsky, who uh, cannot attend due to um, conflicting uh, schedules. So I will. Um, present a couple of words on uh, uh, the Czech perspective uh, uh, of Eastern Partnership uh, with Armenia as well uh, on behalf of uh, Ambassador Kopetsky. Um, so thank you for uh, uh, attending this um, uh, webinar and uh, um, thank you for uh, uh, organizing it uh, uh, because I think it's very useful in those days uh, when we cannot meet physically to at least have different perspectives on a, on a distance. Um, for the Czech foreign policy, the, the Eastern Partnership is uh, one of the long-term priorities. Uh, uh, it is a priority both on the EU uh, level and on bilateral level. Um, and Czech Republic really aims for substantial deepening of relations uh, between the partner countries and the EU. Uh, and uh, Armenia is one of those partners, the Eastern partners that is currently building the new democratic institution uh, and is uh, therefore in the, the core of the Czech uh, attention. Um, the key aim of the Eastern partnership is of course to create conditions for a political deepened uh, association and further economic integration between the EU uh, and the six partner countries. Uh, and uh, it is built on the principle of the joint ownership, which means that the EU uh, aims to involve partners as much as possible in the preparation and implementation of this policy. And I think the current, uh, the current uh, uh, evolution of uh, relations between the EU uh, and Armenia is a good illustration for that, uh, especially thanks to the SEPA agreement. Um, Czech Republic um, um, actually has supported the common statement of uh, Visegrad countries that uh, stipulate some of the key elements of partnership between EU and Visegrad countries in particular uh, and uh, Eastern partners Armenia in particular. Um, uh, in our opinion, the, sh the Eastern partnership shall maintain its um, strategic importance and high priority in the EU external action and the Eastern Partnership beyond 2020 must build upon the implementation of 20 deliverables for 2020, uh, allowing tailor-made approach 
with partners because we are all aware that uh, the the countries in the eastern partnership uh, differ from each other very significantly uh, the political association and uh, economic integration of the eastern partners with the eu remain our main goal and shared values will remain the fundaments of the eastern partnership and those shared values are rules-based international order and international law, democratic practices, the rule of law, uh, and independent judiciary, media, protection of human rights, and the rights of persons belonging to minorities, good governance, sustainable development, and market economy. Uh, the Eastern Partnership should continue to be inclusive and uh, support the European aspirations and choices of the partners, uh, and at the same time differentiate on the basis of partners' commit commitments uh, and aspirations. And this is, uh, again, applicable for a specific case of Armenia. The current uh, uh, international environment puts a special emphasis on resilience of uh, individual countries. Um, and um, the Czech Republic puts quite a high emphasis on uh, um, uh, the resilience. So the Eastern Partnership uh, must focus on comprehensive assistance to partners to build resilient societies. And resilience as a broad concept uh, includes democratic, economic and societal aspects, as well as security, environment and humanitarian dimensions. And those should be transformed into practical activities um, supported by appropriate resources for the benefit of partners and the regional stability of Europe's neighborhood. So building the information security and fighting the disinformation uh, that is currently spreading through social media um, and different other channels, it really requires the independent media, the professional journalism and uh, media literacy. And hybrid threats, including cyber attacks, uh, need to be thoroughly addressed in a, uh, in a way through activities aimed at uh, strengthening resilience and i can say that the very concept of resilience uh, is actually stipulated in the material that was produced by the czech ministry of foreign affairs and it's called the package on resilience for the eastern partnership um, and it was adopted by more than a half of eu member states which uh, uh, frankly speaking came as a positive surprise for the for the czech um, foreign service um, what uh, the ongoing uh, pandemics in Armenia has exposed, it is uh, definitely the need of better civil disaster cooperation uh, and also higher healthcare resilience and, uh, and preparedness. Uh, prosperity and economic progress of Armenia, as well as the other Eastern partners, represents another key focus of uh, Eastern partnership. Um, EU and Eastern partners should make bold steps to increase and improve the connectivity, transport and infrastructural bedrock for the sake of uh, future economic success. So, um, as a conclusion, I would say that at strategic level in Armenia, Czech Republic puts emphasis on the quality implementation of existing contractual framework, the resilience and its uh, concretization, and uh, vision for the future and the opening of other possibilities for sectoral integration of Eastern partners and of course Armenia in particular. Um, in the first two areas, I have to say that we as the Czech uh, Foreign Service, we managed to push our ideas forward in the, uh, uh, and as I said, in the area of resilience, even beyond the, the, the uh, original um, expectations. Uh, so the Czech Republic will continue to support Armenia within the Eastern Partnership Framework and uh, implementation of the SEPA agreement with the European Union um, is uh, definitely one of the uh, major preconditions of successful cooperation of uh, uh, European Union with uh, Armenia. So thank you very much for your attention and again sorry for a little bit improvised uh, conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution and just as you mentioned fighting disinformation I'm glad to say that we are going to start another project on disinformation related to COVID-19 and its threats for democracy in 
EU and the neighborhood uh, in cooperation with Latvian and Romanian partners and in a few days we'll have more information about that. And now it is my pleasure to invite our today's expert Vera Zihachkova from uh, the European, European Institute from Prague uh, to deliver a report on our today's topic. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Armen, and um, also many thanks to Mr. Plesinger for his uh, very comprehensive uh, intervention, because uh, I think now I will be a bit repetitive on some aspects, but uh, I don't think it, uh, it hurts to, to repeat some of the, some of the issues and uh, put them also uh, into the context. So indeed, uh, thank you for this opportunity to meet you online, at least. I think it's uh, within this uh, COVID-19 situation, it's, it's a lot of challenges out there, but it's also uh, many opportunities. And one of them is that uh, it's quite easy uh, to organize such online meetings and, uh, and have an exchange uh, of opinions and uh, suggestions. Um, so thank, thank you very much, Armen, for inviting me. Um, and uh, basically, uh, what I would like to do now is uh, to start uh, start uh, with uh, kind of a summary of current developments in the area of EAB policy as such uh, in Brussels. So that uh, the second part uh, where I will be again referencing some of the issues mentioned by Mr. Plesinger already in terms of uh, the Czech uh, priorities vis-a-vis -vis the Eastern Partnership Policy. Uh, are put uh, more into, into the context. Um, so uh, many of you know that we are nearing the end of uh, one polit policy cycle uh, from the EU perspective, which is uh, the end of the roadmap, uh, the so-called 20 deliverables for 2020, which was also mentioned already. This is the current uh, roadmap for the Eastern Partnership Policy which sets out specific uh, targets and activities uh, which uh, should be implemented. Also, the last year, uh, 2019, was uh, a celebratory year for the Eastern Partnership. Uh, we marked the 10 years anniversary of the Eastern Partnership. So the policy was uh, highly visible, uh, at least here in Brussels. And at the same time, due to the ending policy cycle, it was also a preparatory year uh, for setting out uh, the new policy line for the Eastern Partnership policy uh, beyond 2020. With this, uh, there are several issues uh, from the EU side which are kind of inherently present uh, uh, within the, uh, the Eastern Partnership Policy and its, uh, its future planning, uh, so to say, and Mr. Plesinger uh, already touched upon uh, some of them. Uh, so I would uh, outline uh, five of them. The first one is uh, the level of ambitions and uh, political vision for Eastern Partnership. Uh, so it means basically that uh, the EU member states are not in a full agreement on what the, like the final goal of the policy should be. And uh, in result, it means that uh, the approach the EU institutions especially are taking towards the policy has become uh, in years uh, gradually more and more technical, so to say. So focusing on step-by-step -step implementation of, uh, in some instances, rather technical agenda, which can then be uh, showed uh, as uh, by the institutions uh, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, successes in terms of what the policy has delivered. And uh, since, there, since there is no uh, agreement on the level of ambition, so this is the major approach to, to the implementation of the policy. At the same time, with the new set of uh, EU institutions uh, and with the new European Commission uh, in place, uh, which is led by Ursula von der Leyen, uh, you know probably that one of the new uh, mottos or, or catchphrases of this commission is that this is a geopolitical commission, meaning that the EU wants to, be, want to project more uh, itself in the international arena as a, as a relevant uh, uh, actor, so to say. So vis-a-vis uh, -vis the EAP region, it is also um, a dilemma or issue how to uh, somehow put, uh, put these two 
um, two issues uh, together. So at the same time, uh, quite uh, a not really a disagreement, but uh, some kind of uh, um, yeah, uh, not having a one strong policy among the member states or how the policy how the policy should uh, should develop in the future, and at the same time, this overall ambition of playing uh, a larger role in the international arena. Uh, the second issue is the effective delivery of the policy uh, that is connected uh, also to the fact that uh, the implementation has become uh, more and more technical, at least uh, from the point of view of uh, some member states, um, some EU member states. Uh, the EU institutions uh, has started uh, stressing the aspect of uh, the policy delivering, especially for the citizens uh, a couple of years ago already. And, uh, but still, uh, the functionality of the policy is not measured uh, against this yardstick, uh, so to say, uh, fully. So the, uh, in parallel to the shaping of the new policy, we have the process of uh, evaluation of the current deliverables, which uh, which should be indeed uh, measured against against this criteria. Another issue is uh, the effort uh, of at least uh, some EU member states, uh, Czech Republic included, and uh, EU institutions, at least some of them, to keep the policy high on the EU agenda. So I mentioned that in 2019, it was the celebratory year, 10 years uh, of the Eastern Partnership uh, with many good results, uh, you know, the EU could have show showcased. But uh, at the moment, there are many competing priorities uh, in the EU. So this is uh, another aspect we have to bear in mind. The EAP is really competing with, uh, with many other priorities, uh, not even mentioning uh, the COVID-19 crisis, which is really taking a lot of attention of the EU institutions and uh, most likely will be um, in the near future as well. Uh, another issue is uh, uh, the EAP policy uh, has to be flexible and inclusive. I think that is something uh, Mr. Pleschinger was mentioning as well. So uh, it means that there is a certain need to combine the push uh, for the multi-speed partnership uh, since some of the countries uh, which are associated to the EU, those who have association agreements slash DCFTA, meaning Ukraine, uh, Georgia and Moldova. So um, they would like to have more and they, they were pushing for more and especially Ukraine is not uh, very happy, so to say, uh, in the Eastern Partnership, uh, partnership Framework, since uh, many of Ukrainian stakeholders uh, feel that the policy is not delivering uh, a lot of added value for Ukraine uh, in this framework. So uh, there is a need to somehow uh, combine this need for uh, flexibility and offering a bit more uh, to those who want more and inclusiveness. So the need to really retain the regional approach and uh, keep the policy open uh, to everybody. And in this sense, uh, we have witnessed uh, um, especially a very uh, you know, strong idea coming uh, from Lithuania, namely for, from the former uh, Lithuanian Prime Minister, Mr. Kubilius, who is currently uh, the head uh, co-chair uh, or co-president of the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, so he is very much uh, behind the idea of so-called uh, TRIO. So the trio of the three associated countries which should be offered uh, something more uh, originally, both in terms of uh, policy content, but also at the level of structure and institutions. So adding a specific layer into the EAP policy architecture uh, for these uh, three countries. And uh, basically with, uh, with the aim to have a very, um, uh, to have a strong commitment uh, for the trio uh, for in the time horizon of 2030 uh, and follow the path set up by the Western Balkan, Balkan countries. So basically it is a push to, uh, to keep the membership perspective open. Uh, there are people who believe that in order to keep the motivation of the Eastern Partnership countries to reform 
there really needs to be a very strong carrot uh, from the side of the EU to keep um, not only uh, the elites, but also the populations uh, uh, engaged uh, in this reform process. Um, on the other hand, uh, such a strong push uh, for multi-speed partnership could lead to certain fragmentarization, which is uh, in the eyes of many uh, not desirable because uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, is uh, more and more uh, seen as a, as a region and the benefits of the, of the regional cooperation, not only uh, from the EU side, like having the region and the regional uh, policy approach, but uh, to support and strengthen the cooperation among uh, the countries uh, themselves within the region. Uh, it is also seen as a, as a very important feature of uh, increased uh, resilience, uh, which was also already this new concept was already mentioned uh, uh, by the previous uh, speaker. And the last issue I would like to mention is uh, funding. So. Um, Currently, the European Union is also uh, negotiating, the member states are negotiating the new uh, budget for the European Union for the next seven years. Uh, in the Eurospeak, it's called Multiannual uh, Financial Framework or, or MFF. Uh, this process has been also highly impacted by the COVID-19 because uh, now not only the original negotiations uh, on the new MFF were delayed significantly because of uh, disagreements, but uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemics, uh, there is a need to, to add on the top of the existing proposal, a new package of uh, uh, COVID-19 recovery measures. So only this week there will be uh, another European Council which should uh, move these uh, negotiations forward, but uh, still it's, uh, it's very much delayed and uh, for the Eastern Partnership uh, countries, it means that also uh, the source uh, of funding for all EU activities and uh, actions uh, in the Eastern Partnership countries uh, is uh, dependent on how this uh, MFF negotiations uh, will go ahead. Um, some of you might know that the current instrument from, from which the EU is funding, uh, uh, not only supporting the governments uh, directly, but also, for example, the funding to the civil society organizations, is out of the so-called European Neighborhood Instrument. And uh, European Neighborhood Instrument uh, within the next MFF will cease to exist and will be replaced by a big uh, instrument, which is called Neighborhood uh, Develop Development and International Cooperation Instrument. And uh, this instrument, uh, under, under the roof of this instrument, there will be several currently existing EU instruments for funding external actions unified and uh, put together so that uh, the Commission has more flexibility in terms of uh, how the funding is being disbursed, programmed, uh, and there's more coherence and um, the new priorities are better addressed. But of course, uh, this issue somehow um, entails uh, certain challenges as well for the Eastern Partnership. Uh, in the, uh, under the current in, uh, arrangement of the European Neighborhood Instrument, uh, there was a gentleman's agreement that the funding will be divided roughly one third of the funding going to the Eastern Partnership and two thirds to the, to the Southern uh, neighborhood. It's not uh, written in the legislation. It's really based only on some kind of uh, agreement, uh, tacit agreement among the member states. This is the case. Although, for example, uh, if we recount per capita, it's very much to the benefit of, uh, of the Eastern Partnership. So, and now with the changing, uh, not really changing, but uh, a bit different uh, foreign policy priorities of the, of the European Union, meaning also the emphasis on uh, migration mitigation, now the, the COVID, uh, COVID uh, uh, mitigation and recovery, and uh, more focus to the southern neighborhood as, as proposed uh, by at least some of the member states. Um, this is an open question how the final agreement on, uh, on the funding uh, will be put on paper and agreed. 
uh, including specific features of the current ENI, which is the civil society facility, for example, specific funding uh, budget line within the instrument, uh, which was dedicated to uh, civil society funding, both at the regional and bilateral level. So all, all these details still, uh, still have to be finalized and the process both uh, of the uh, funding negotiations under MFF and the NDICI legislation has not been uh, finished. So um, this is for the context. Uh, then uh, furthermore, you know that uh, uh, DG NIR uh, opened the structured consultation on the Eastern Partnership uh, in 2019. So during the year of the 10 years anniversary uh, with this idea of having an input for, uh, for the future policy line of, uh, for the Eastern Partnership policy. Uh, with the deadline uh, in October 2019, and indeed the level of input uh, was quite uh, quite surprising. And uh, the Commission received a lot of input uh, from the civil society, uh, from the member states, from the EAP governments, but also from other actors, uh, business uh, associations, trade unions, etc., um, etc. Et so uh, this input uh, was put together and uh, this led to the drafting of the joint communication uh, of the European Commission and External Action Service, which is titled Eastern Partnership Policy Beyond 2020, Reinforcing Resilience and Eastern Partnership that Delivers for All. So that's the title of the document, a bit long. Uh, it was published on March um, 18. So basically uh, the document is pre-COVID. Uh, COVID uh, situation is not very much reflected in this uh, joint communication. There is only uh, one reference to supporting uh, the health and uh, public health systems in, in the Eastern Partnership countries. So this uh, will still have to be elaborated uh, in the implementation documents. But basically, uh, this document, which uh, some claim is the, the first document ever, which the College of the uh, Commissioners approved uh, online, via online voting, um, is uh, stating the general policy line for the Eastern Partnership policy uh, beyond uh, 2020. And indeed, uh, as mentioned already, uh, resilience here is the, is the overarching uh, framework uh, for, for the implementation. And uh, there are five long-term policy objectives which are defined in this uh, communication. Um, the first uh, objective is uh, uh, to support resilient, sustainable and integrated economies. Uh, and uh, if you read the document, which has, uh, I don't know, 18, 20 pages, and uh, I suggest uh, to everybody who is interested to read it, um, the chapter on uh, economic development is, uh, is very much developed. Uh, it's, it's quite clear from this document that the primacy of uh, eco economic development within the resilience framework is clearly there and all other goals are somehow subdued uh, to this uh, priority. It's, uh, it's very much the priority of the current commissioner as well uh, in all his speeches uh, the first issue he will be you know, mentioning uh, more or less is the now the economic recovery, of course, but uh, the economic uh, development of the EAP countries as, as a means and tools uh, to support the development in uh, other uh, policy areas as well. The second long-term uh, objective is the accountable institutions, rule of law and security. So something uh, we currently know as uh, the priority under EAP Eastern Partnership Platform 1. Uh, the third priority uh, towards environmental and climate uh, resilience. Uh, here, uh, definitely the implementation of the European New Green Deal uh, will be a big issue uh, in the future policy implementation. Uh, already it has been agreed that uh, at least 25% of all uh, funding that will be dedicated, dedicated to the Eastern Partnership uh, has to go for this priority. Uh, so meaning uh, for climate uh, 
relevant uh, actions uh, which are connected to the to the green deal as defined by the by the european commission the fourth priority is together for resilient digital transformation uh, so again the digital uh, transformation seen here uh, by the commission as a tool for overall um, reform of the, uh, namely the economies uh, of the Eastern Partnership countries. And the last priority is called together for resilient, fair and inclusive societies. So this is uh, the area we know currently as uh, people to people contact with some aspects um, shifted from the policy areas covered by former platform one. So. Uh, for example, fair elections, uh, human rights, uh, but uh, also the free support to free media, which was also mentioned uh, by my uh, predecessor, now fall under, uh, under this priority. So this is the new framework and uh, this will also translate into the ways how the policy will be implemented. Uh, we know there is a multilateral architecture in place for implementation of the Eastern Partnership Policy, which is uh, putting the 20 deliverables uh, into life and uh, allows for uh, review and monitoring of uh, how the policy is implemented. So with this new uh, policy line in place, basically uh, it means that also the EAP architecture will change a bit in the future. Probably it will not be revolution, uh, Every time when you hear now commission people speaking about, uh, about this new EAP uh -huh. policy review or new policy line, they, they keep saying it's not a revolution, but an evolution. So I think with uh, the EAP architecture, again, it will, be, it will be an evolution. So we will definitely see some changes uh, in terms of how the EAP framework uh, will, be, will be structured in the uh, upcoming months and the years. Uh, so I mentioned uh, that the communication outlines the primacy of economic development uh, within the resilience framework and basically uh, the support to this economic development should be propelled by the green uh, slash environmental and digital transformations. So this is designed to lie at the heart of the new resilience uh, and uh, as I mentioned the other policy objectives uh, playing rather supporting roles. So um, for me, uh, coming uh, from the civil society background, uh, I mean, Armen mentioned when introducing me, I am associated fellow at the Prague-based think tank, uh, Europrom Institute for European Policy, uh, but, but I'm also advocacy manager at the secretariat of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. And uh, yeah, perhaps uh, some of you are familiar with the forum and the network. So uh, when we have been looking at uh, the way how the communication is uh, drafted, indeed, there's really the primacy of uh, the economic part of the policy and the other objectives being rather in a supporting position that was uh, uh, of a concern to us, not uh, uh, only because uh, also within the communication itself, uh, you can find uh, parts which are outlining that so far the EAP policy has not been very successful in delivering uh, in the area of democratic governance, rule of law, fight against corruption, as well as support and promotion of independent media and enabling environment for civil society. So although this uh, has been priority uh, all over and from the beginning, uh, the results uh, have not been unfortunately uh, optimal. Uh, in the language of the communication, you can see that the different elements of uh, democratic governance are now split into a number of uh, priority areas. Um, probably as a way of ensuring that democratic, accountable and governing practices become a key principle of entire EAP policy. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, it's very important uh, how this general uh, policy line will be transform transformed into the implementation documents, uh, more specifically into the new roadmap and the new set of uh, EAP deliverables. Uh, with uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, hitting EU member states and uh, as in the same way as the EAP countries, 
of course, uh, the EU uh, mobilized uh, to, to provide uh, response and support to Eastern Partnership countries. So uh, the words like solidarity and interdependence uh, came back uh, into, uh, into the forefront and into the vocabulary of, of the stakeholders here in Brussels. Um, some of you might think that, uh, okay, at the beginning, uh, the EU uh, member states, there was not that much solidarity among the EU member states and uh, that the, uh, the response and uh, unified action was rather slow, uh, but uh, I would argue, uh, knowing how the EU institutions operate, that uh, the response from the side of the European Commission and uh, the speed with which they were able to uh, reprogram uh, the funding uh, was quite, uh, uh, quite impressive. So I would say they managed in, in relatively short time to reprogram uh, around 840 million euros for uh, for the imminent uh, COVID-19 response. And uh, in that sense, uh, I would say this first stage uh, was, uh, in my view, rather, uh, rather effective. Uh, now the next step will be more like long-term assistance also with mitigating the impact of the COVID. Uh, and here, of course, uh, especially uh, for the civil society, there is a big task to keep an eye uh, on how this funding is spent and uh, uh, it is necessary to monitor uh, the whole process. Um, back to the policy framework. So uh, after the, uh, the communication from the Commission and External Action Service uh, was uh, adopted. The EU member states uh, within the European Council uh, agreed on the so-called Council conclusions. Uh, this is a response to the joint communication and it was issued on May 11. Uh, it's also, a, all these documents are online, so if you are interested, uh, you, can, you can read them. So basically, the member states, by the, this uh, issuing these conclusions, uh, agreed with the policy line uh, outlined by the Commission and the External Action Service. There are some specific uh, areas uh, where the member states expressed uh, concerns or reservations. One of them, uh, which might be interesting uh, for uh, for the Armenian audience, is, uh, is the visa policy, because. Um, uh, you might be aware of the fact that uh, the countries who have the uh, visa waiver uh, program in place with the European Union, so visa-free regime basically, Ukraine, uh, Georgia and Moldova, so in some member states uh, the increased number of uh, applications for asylum uh, from the citizens of these countries, uh, namely from Georgia, was uh, was noted and uh, several member states expressed uh, their concerns over, over such a development. Uh, at certain point, uh, there was even a possibility that visa suspension mechanism will be activated. So uh, it is a bit uh, sensitive uh, question and with this development uh, in the council conclusions, you can find uh, a specific article on visa policy and uh, the possibility to launch the new visa liberalization dialogue with uh, the remaining countries uh, is of course uh, an open question for consideration, but uh, provided that the whole process uh, with those countries uh, that already uh, benefit from visa free travel will be well managed and uh, under control, so to say. Um, after, um, after the council conclusions, um, there was uh, a meeting of the EAP foreign minister scheduled. Uh, it took uh, place uh, online, EU and EAP foreign ministers, a uh, regular ministerial meeting. But also uh, in line with the overall timeline of the Eastern Partnership Policy Implementation, there was supposed to be a regular uh, EAP summit uh, in June. Uh, more specifically, it was scheduled for June 18, already half a year ago. Uh, 
uh, but due to COVID-19 pandemics, of course, it was not possible to organize this meeting um, in person. And it took quite some time uh, for the EU institutions uh, and uh, the member states and the EAP governments in the end to agree to, uh, to agree on a specific, uh, on new format uh, for such a meeting. Uh, it uh, in the end uh, happened in a way of a video conference of EU and EAP leaders, uh, so it didn't qualify as a full-fledged summit. Um, no declaration was produced. Normally, when there is a EU, uh, EU EAP summit, a couple of months ahead of the summit, the declaration, which is a final uh, political document, so to say, uh, uh, is uh, being drafted, uh, but the process uh, didn't start and uh, it was decided in the end that there will be no uh, like written output uh, from the video conference of the leaders. Um, two issues were discussed uh, during this meeting, uh, a COVID-19 uh, response and uh, the long-term uh, policy objective for the Eastern Partnership. So the five policy objectives uh, I was just uh, mentioning in uh, connection to the uh, to the uh, European Commission communication. Um, at the same time, European Parliament uh, also uh, drafted its report on Eastern Partnership uh, recommendations for the EAP summit, which was planned. Uh, the report was voted uh, in July. It's quite uh, comprehensive. Uh, there's many amendments uh, that were tabled. Uh, it's covering a lot of uh, policy areas. Uh, with a lot of suggestions uh, for the member states and the EU institutions. Uh, in this report, you can find a reference to uh, the TRIO proposal I was mentioning. So the proposal uh, put out by uh, MEP Kubilius, which in the meantime gathered the support of a la larger group of um, MEPs. Uh, so it is an idea which is uh, which is valid and which is always present in in this discourse of, of the on the future of the eap policy and uh, it was also agreed that the next regular eap summit uh, is planned now for march uh, 2021 uh, so it will be taking place under the portuguese presidency of the council of the european union um, now uh, from this point of time until the next EAP summit, uh, there will be quite uh, important policy processes uh, going on um, at the same time. So first one will be uh, drafting of the new EAP deliverables, uh, so the new EAP roadmap. Uh, the timeline has not been finalized. Uh, we've heard information that the EU institutions are currently during the summer break, uh, discussing uh, how the procedure uh, will be planned and um, the timeline for the whole process. Uh, so it should be unveiled uh, sometime in September. Um, but we know already that uh, some of the proposals will be discussed uh, in the framework of the EAP multilateral architecture. So during the meetings of the EAP platforms and panels, at the same time, there will be evaluation process of the current deliverables uh, going on. So 20 deliverables for 2020, it's uh, the whole cycle is ending at the end of the year, this was mentioned. So there has to be an overall evaluation on, uh, of uh, how the current uh, roadmap uh, delivered really on the, on the targets uh, and uh, goals. Uh, and uh, also in parallel, the summit declaration will be drafted. And uh, this is important document because as I said, it sets out the general uh, like political agreement among the heads of states and governments on, uh, on the future uh, of the policy. And uh, you also probably know that uh, the German EU presidency has just uh, started in July. They took over after Croatia. Uh, it's a very ambitious uh, presidency. And uh, in the area of Eastern partnership and the whole uh, EU policy towards the Eastern neighborhood, so including uh, Russia, 
uh, the slogan is they want to play a bridge between uh, you know, East and West. So let's see how the German presidency, what, uh, what will be its input uh, into the future of the uh, Eastern partnership policy. Some reflections uh, on the video conference of the leaders, which replaced uh, the June, uh, the planned June EAP summit. Uh, it's uh, generally considered uh, as a very uh, successful, um, uh, successful meeting in a sense that uh, it took place. I mean, it might sound <laughs> a bit. Uh, um, a bit uh, strange, but uh, basically uh, the reflection is that it was a, a kind of a happy moment for the policy because uh, with all uh, you know uh, policy issues going on with the COVID nineteen crisis, uh, economic recovery, MFF. Uh, I mean, from the EU side, of course, um, et cetera, et cetera. There was still time for the leaders to really meet and discuss the future of the Eastern Partnership Policy. Um, the, the policy got uh, lots of attention. It's still alive and has a strategic value for, for the EU member states and uh, Eastern partners. But at the same time, um, there are kind of no big expectations uh, after, uh, after this meeting and uh, especially for some member states uh, who are uh, within this group of like-minded countries, if you like, who would like to see more politically ambitious uh, vision for the Eastern Partnership, uh, there is not much. Uh, uh, at the same time, um, nothing specific uh, in terms of structures uh, has been offered to the three AADC FTA countries, uh, which is a result uh, that basically means that if there will be something more offered, uh, and there will be definitely, um, it will be open to all partners. So I think for Armenia, especially this is a good news because uh, everything uh, which will be on the table in terms of uh, going, going ahead with the uh, deepening of the integration, both uh, economic and political, uh, it should be open to all partners willing uh, and able to, to join. Uh, as I said, some member states uh, were not uh, that happy with, uh, with the result. They see it as a more uh, like a technical process and uh, that the whole policy is uh, lacking a bit uh, a vision or a political goal uh, in itself. At the same time, if uh, this uh, argument is put out uh, to the representatives of the Commission and External Action Service, um, they respond along the lines that uh, the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen uh, was asking the services, meaning uh, the European Commission and the External Action Service, to use the full extent of the existing agreements, uh, so SEPA as well and go deeper in integration and uh, there is a big scope uh, in terms of what uh, can be done and much more uh, can be done. So this a bit uh, lengthy um, introductory remarks uh, on where we are with the, with the policy cycle. Um, and now I will speak uh, briefly about uh, Czech Republic's perspective on EAP because it also goes back and trickle down to some issues which I, I mentioned uh, uh, in the previous uh, introductory remarks. Um, so basically the Czech Republic, as mentioned already by the previous speaker for the Czech Republic, uh, the Eastern Partnership has been always uh, a foreign policy priority. Um, it's uh, one of the founding uh, fathers of the Eastern Partnership, uh, although the history records uh, only uh, Sweden and Poland as the, as the founding uh, parents of the policy, but the Czech Republic was very much involved as well during its EU Council presidency in 2019. And uh, also the first EAP summit took place in Prague in uh, 2009. Uh, so I think uh, we very much uh, feel the ownership uh, over, over this policy and um, as mentioned, it has been always uh, a foreign policy priority. 
uh, the approach to the policy is uh, and has been uh, value-based, uh, has been quite complex, uh, also reflecting, uh, you know, especially in the last couple of years, more and more, and more on the economic interests uh, of the Czech Republic, strengthening the economic diplomacy. And it's very much forward-looking. So it means that uh, the Czech diplomacy is really very much engaged into the debates uh, about how the policy will be shaped uh, in the future and uh, has a uh, good contribution and uh, good ideas on, uh, within, this, uh, within this debate. On the other hand, uh, I would say um, it's a bit uh, limited uh, in capacity uh, meaning uh, just going uh, down to basis, meaning in terms of manpower and resources invested, uh, given it is really uh, such a prominently mentioned uh, foreign policy priority. And uh, the performance really depends on personalities. So it's very much uh, personalized. Uh, at the moment, uh, there is a very efficient uh, EAP ambassador uh, representing uh, the Czech MFA and uh, also um, the staff uh, here in Brussels of the permanent representation is, uh, is very visible and very active. Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be the case every time. So, so this is uh, just uh, on the margins uh, when assessing uh, the performance of the country in this policy area. Um, during this uh, key period of uh, 2019 and 2020, which are the years of uh, preparing for the new policy cycle, as I mentioned, and uh, putting it in place, uh, the Czech uh, diplomacy really continued to be among the one of the most active and uh, it is a recognized player on Eastern Partnership uh, here in Brussels. Um, the, uh, the Czech Republic uh, in 2019 organized two high-level conferences hosted uh, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry. Uh, on the future of the EAP. So again, gathering uh, input uh, not from the domestic uh, stakeholders in the Czech Republic, but also, of course, inviting uh, foreign stakeholders and exchanging uh, opinions. Um, here in Brussels, uh, the uh, Czech Parliament representation hosted uh, a working lunch of the EAP ambassadors at the Corepa level already in March 2019 for preliminary exchange of uh, opinions uh, on the future of the policy and uh, continued with a series of meetings uh, of the, the so-called like-minded countries, so countries who are uh, pushing uh, for this policy uh, item at the EU agenda mostly consisting of uh, the Central Eastern European countries, so the Baltic countries, Visegrad countries, Sweden, and uh, involved also Germany with this vision of uh, the German presidency coming up. So I would say very, uh, very strategic uh, approach uh, from the side of uh, the Czech uh, diplomacy. And uh, in result, uh, Czech Republic came up with a quite influential non-paper, the, the package uh, of proposals already mentioned by Mr. Plesinger. Uh, basically a non-paper, non comprehensive non-paper showcasing resilience as the future framework uh, for the Eastern Partnership Policy. And uh, as it was already also mentioned, it was endorsed by uh, more than uh, half, oh, I have, I mean, I counted 10, but Mr. Plesinger said the half of the EU member states, so I would have to double check. But um, uh, quite a critical mass of EU member states supported uh, this non-paper, and uh, in result, after the structured consultation I mentioned, the structured consultation run by the European Commission, um, to which the Czech Republic, of course, uh, also contributed with its position. This approach, resilience, uh, was adopted as the new kind of meta-narrative for the future of the Eastern Partnership. So I would say this, this is, uh, we can really say this was a success of the Czech diplomacy. Uh, although even if the Czech diplomats were not 100% satisfied with the outcome of the of the structured consultation, so with uh, the whole language of the communication. 
uh, of the on the future of the Eastern Partnership. Uh, for the Czechs, the main problem uh, is also the lack of uh, political uh, narrative uh, and vision for the future developments uh, of, of the policy, as well as somehow unconvin unconvincing approach to the basic values of the cooperation. So here, uh, again, I'm talking about uh, the democratic reforms, uh, reforms in the area of rule of law, judicial reforms, uh, support to uh, free media, uh, enabling environment for civil society, etc. etc. Um, at the, generally among the EU member states, the Czech Republic uh, stood, uh, stands out among uh, the more ambitious countries uh, in terms of uh, ambitions and uh, level of future relations uh, with the Eastern Partnership countries in Armenia. Uh, really acknowledging, and you've heard it from the Czech diplomat himself, acknowledging the European aspiration of the associated countries. So basically the um, promise of uh, the future EU membership. Uh, at the same time, uh, Czech Republic is not very supportive uh, of the idea of uh, TRIO uh, as promoted by uh, MEP Kubilius and uh, the Baltic, some of the Baltic countries, uh, since uh, it feels it would uh, split the original format uh, of the policy and really prevent the full uh, inclusivity from one to another category. So, um, at the same time, uh, Czech Republic is also very much uh, supporting the sectoral integration approach. Uh, so going sector by sector and really offering more uh, in relation to uh, also to the demand uh, from the uh, Eastern partners side. The uh, Visegrad uh, 4 presidency uh, of the Czech Republic was also mentioned already. So the Visegrad group, which consists of Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, and Hungary. Uh, but, uh, I mean, despite certain um, uh, differences in, uh, in priorities and preferences, uh, I think Eastern Partnership uh, as a foreign policy priority is something all four of them can agree on uh, without uh, much, uh, pro many problems. So, uh, Czech Republic was presiding uh, over the Visegrad group uh, in 2019-2020. Now it's, uh, it's Poland uh, that took over. Um, and also uh, Czech Republic pushed for having uh, the EU's Eastern policy in the core of the agenda, uh, both uh, at the level of state officials and the coordination meetings, but also very high level consultation among the foreign ministers uh, and ministries. Uh, so in April 2020, and it was also already mentioned, uh, there was uh, a Visegrad joint statement on the future of the Eastern Partnership uh, policy beyond 2020. And I'm not going to repeat the features uh, and the uh, priorities already mentioned uh, by Mr. Plesinger. Uh, but uh, beyond the statement, uh, the ministers uh, of the Visegrad countries also agreed on establishing a new program uh, titled V4 uh, East Solidarity. And out of this program, uh, the actions and activities to deal with uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Eastern Partnership uh, countries uh, will be funded. This uh, funding will go through International Visegrad Fund, and I think it will amount to 250,000 uh, uh, euros. Um, I was checking the website of the fund before this uh, webinar, but uh, I couldn't see any, any call for proposals or any implementation guidelines. Uh, so I think it's still in the process, but uh, it should be upcoming. Um, there was also a ministerial conference of uh, the Visegrad uh, Four uh, and EAP countries, foreign ministers uh, scheduled. Uh, but in the end, it had to be cancelled due to the uh, coronavirus uh, emergency, so it didn't take place. And uh, um, four um, 
for the future planning of uh, the Czech uh, policy towards the EAP, it is a very important, that's a very important milestone, and that's the upcoming uh, presidency of the Czech Republic uh, in the EU Council, and that is coming up in the second half of uh, 2022. Uh, the Czech Republic already expressed uh, its uh, readiness uh, and ambition to host the next EAP summit um, in Prague. Uh, in the second half of 20, uh, 2022. Uh, but now we see that the whole tight timetable of the policy cycle has shifted uh, due to COVID-19 crisis. And now with the upcoming summit in, in March uh, 2021, it is uh, an open question if, uh, if it will be agreed uh, by the EU to have another summit already in the second half of 2020. Uh, so this uh, remains to be seen and uh, in relation to the summit already some quite ambitious ideas were already voiced by the Czech diplomacy. So um, I hope uh, it will materialize this, uh, this opportunity for, for the Czech diplomacy, but it's not, uh, it's not uh, given, it's not certain. The country in my view uh, would be in a good position to act uh, as a broker on many issues related to the EAP agenda. Uh, of, of course, it is perceived as a country which uh, pertains to the group of uh, like-minded countries supporting uh, the EAP policy, but unlike other, uh, especially Central Eastern European EU member states, it has uh, the advantage of uh, not having uh, any direct borders uh, with the Eastern Partnership uh, countries. So also it's kind of a bit, uh, has kind of a bit more free hands in um, you know, dealing with some uh, bilateral agendas, which might be more uh, complicated for other uh, EU member states. And very briefly, because I don't think we have that much time uh, left, uh, at uh, looking at the policy implementation level, uh, so within the EAP architecture, uh, so at the level of EAP platforms and panels, uh, Czech Republic uh, has been generally very active across uh, across the uh, across the picture. Uh, there's a very long-standing priority in uh, supporting the public administration reform uh, here, specifically together with uh, Estonia. On the course of last two three years, the Czech Republic has been organizing a week-long uh, seminar, namely for local government officials and uh, self-governance uh, from the Eastern Partnership uh, countries, including also civil society representatives and other players. And uh, the seminars are focusing on inclusive decision-making, sustainability, um, environmental issues, uh, energy efficiency, uh, yeah, you name it. So very, uh, I would say, uh, very popular and very uh, good contribution of the Czech Republic uh, to the implementation of the of the 20 deliverables. Uh, but there are many different uh, areas. Uh, the Czech Republic uh, is really active within the EAP architecture. Um, in near uh, future, uh, the focus uh, should be on uh, environmental education and awareness raising. Uh, cooperation in higher education and, uh, of course, promoting uh, resilience from the point of view of concrete projects to be implemented uh, within the new EAP roadmap. And uh, one of the specific uh, priorities of the Czech Republic, which is also mentioned in the, in the um, joint uh, statement of the Visegrad four countries on the future of the Eastern Partnership Policy, is the support to create or establish a new EAP investment agency in Brussels. So basically an agency which would be uh, supporting and helping uh, with bringing the uh, FDIs for foreign direct investments into the EAP countries. Um, Czech uh, diplomacy is also very good in uh, cooperation with the civil society, very, very open. Uh, to um, policy advice, but also to organizing uh, joint events. And uh, yeah, so uh, this is also very, very well perceived. And um, 
As for other tools uh, beyond the already mentioned uh, uh, scheme agreed in response to COVID, uh, which should be provided via International Visegrad Fund, so the For East Solidarity, uh, there are other uh, tools uh, which are used at a bilateral level. So one of them is uh, the transition program, uh, which is run by the Czech MFA. Uh, that's a program which is funding uh, the civil society projects uh, uh, that are implemented uh, in cooperation of uh, Czech uh, civil society organizations and uh, local, so in case of Armenia, Armenian NGOs. Um, there is a call every year and uh, also the Czech uh, embassies in the Eastern Partnership countries are funding uh, small projects targeting especially uh, the civil society and uh, specific issues and priorities set up uh, by the embassies based on their uh, analysis of the situation in the countries. And uh, beyond the COVID response at the level of International Visegrad Fund, there is also a regular call for uh, the for EAP uh, projects uh, from which I suspect uh, uh, the project uh, in which frames I'm speaking at the moment is, uh, is also funded. So I would uh, stop here uh, with the overview. Of course, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vera. I had some technical problems a few seconds ago with the internet connection. Do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Ah, oh, oh, fine. Then uh, thank you for the very substantial presentation on several aspects uh, concerning the joint communication reinforcing resilience and this partnership that delivers for all. Yeah, I remember the, there were articles published by the EU delegations in all six partnership countries, mostly so articles by high representative Borrell and Commissioner for Neighborhood and Enlightenment Policy Varhei mostly the same text, but adjusted to each country, which kind of assistance the EU provided previously within the Eastern Partnership Framework, loans, support to small and medium enterprises, student exchange on the Erasmus Plus and so on and so forth. And they called the proposals mentioned in the joint communication ambitions yet achievable. Well, with COVID-19 and other issues that may appear, some achievements may become more difficult or some work may have to be postponed, but let's hope that some of the proposals will be implemented and Hopefully, the more for more principle will work. And now being transformed into more for more and less for less. Because previously, if, as far as I can, could see, that was not quite the case. So now I would like to ask the participants if anybody has questions. There is the possibility to ask via chat or to turn on the mic, turn on the microphone and ask your questions or to comment in person. So, who would like to make a contribution? Please feel free to do so.
Perhaps if I may, uh, a quick comment on uh, more for more and less for less. You mentioned, uh, uh, yes, Armen. Yeah, so indeed, uh, this, uh, this aspect and how the condition conditionality uh, will be translated into uh, the implementation roadmap is it's key for the future, uh, the upcoming three years at least. And uh, we have heard uh, some proposals now that's basically uh, the benchmarks for applying uh, less for less uh, could be also some products which are developed by the civil society. So, for example, there is this CSO meter, which is measuring uh, the level of uh, enabling environment for civil society in the Eastern Partnership countries. And uh, apparently, it has been considered as one of the possible uh, benchmarks against which uh, the conditionality uh, can be applied. So, it's quite a, an interesting, uh, I mean, it has been floated. This idea has been floated uh, already some time ago, but uh, hopefully this time uh, it will be able to uh, implement it really into, into the new roadmap and uh, somehow uh, make it as one of the conditions for, uh, for more or more or less for less. Probably this is not that much relevant for Armenia, but uh, for other countries of the Eastern Partnership, of course, this is very, uh, very important. Uh, yes, uh, I remember a few years ago, for example, Moldovan analyst wrote that not applying this principle in both or more or less, but just having it sometimes the like more for nothing uh, actually was not beneficial for the AP because uh, civil societies in several countries uh, were concerned with human rights situation, corruption, other issues, and uh, turning a blind eye sort of compromised the use values and the use approaches and uh, the civil societies could feel that uh, there was a lack of approach that, that uh, some non-democratic or other bad practices deserve. <clears throat> so, uh, okay. uh, I think we have some participants from the army um, who participate in the Armenian chapter of the civil society forum. Does anybody have questions related to that, maybe? Okay, a kind of action. Then I'll try to uh, uh, I'll say something about this uh, visa liberalization negotiations between EU and Armenia. And uh, you mentioned that there were some issues with false asylum claims. This used to be an issue, and still in some cases, until a few months ago in Armenia, although. In the recent years, there were voluntary or semi-voluntary returns from um, hundreds of people from Germany and also from other countries. But uh, now we have a situation that even people who got visas before cannot travel. And how will this maybe postpone the negotiations or what will be the additional negative effects of COVID-19 perhaps? Um, you mean on the long-term visa liberalization dialogue? Yes, on the people's mobility 
mm. more generally? Um, the, the issue I mentioned, uh, it was more related to the, uh, to the visa liberalization dialogue in the long term leading to visa free travel. And uh, that was, uh, I think, not so much linked to the number of uh, asylum requests uh, from the Armenian citizens. It's, it was more like uh, um, there's an issue with th those countries that already have visa liberalization, visa free travel in place, namely Georgia. So uh, after Georgia got the visa free travel, some member states, uh, not only Germany, but also Sweden, for example, um, registered uh, quite an increase uh, in the asylum requests um, in like a uh, increase in hundreds. Uh, so yeah, there were certain concerns uh, from those member states that, uh, you know, this development is not uh, desirable and uh, they even, you know, at certain point of time wanted to open this um, procedure which would uh, reverse the uh, visa-free uh, travel. Uh, for the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the you know imminent uh, possibility for the citizens of Armenia to travel, um, yeah I mean of course I'm, I'm not a specialist but there are two issues. One is the list of uh, the safe countries so to say. Uh, to and from which the citizens can travel, but it's not only on the side of the EU, it's also on the side of uh, Armenian government. But uh, now with Armenia still being in the situation when the pandemic is, uh, is not, uh, um, you know, the, the development is uh, still a bit concerning. Uh, of course, yeah, it's, uh, it has an impact on, on the whole procedure, but uh, Maybe for this, uh, colleagues from the Czech Embassy would be more, um, you know, uh, would have more expert knowledge on how this process is, is, is going. Uh, thank you. I just, uh, some EU member states, I guess, uh, get the individual, and, or all of them get the individual approach in addition to the EU. Yesterday, I, for example, saw the Hungarian list of countries they divided into green, yellow, and red, which will be applied from tomorrow, if I'm correct. And it was strange to see that they put also Georgia on the red list. And the US was yellow, but Canada red. So the New Zealand was on the red list as well. So there is perhaps some misunderstanding on the decision-making level. Or could it be so? Yeah, uh, I mean, the EU at this uh, uh, specific case, because it's a public health issue, uh, the EU has only uh, like recommendation power. So at the level of EU, they can agree certain principles and lists even, and recommend to the EU member states uh, what they should, uh, what their you know steps uh, should be and policy should be. Uh, but the member states have quite a big uh, leeway to implement whatever uh, they decide uh, internally at the, level, at the national level. So it's a specific situation because it's a public health emergency. Yeah. It's not the regular policy process related to uh, visa regimes. Well, if there are no questions, uh, usually online meetings are shorter than meetings in person, so we may wrap up. If you would like to say a few words, maybe. Um, for me, indeed, uh... It would be interesting to, uh, in the framework of your project, to also, uh, you know, uh, have some uh, summary, if you will, be uh, preparing on uh, what the other uh, Visegrad countries uh, are also planning and what their positions are. And then you mentioned that there will be, 
you will have another segment of the project which will go at the level of specific policies and uh, there I guess uh, how the expertise uh, from the Visegrad countries can be more helpful so if there are any specific ideas coming uh, out uh, from this discussion which would be also relevant for uh, the civil society forum at the level of uh, I mean advocacy messages and how we can help you then uh, promote these ideas please uh, don't hesitate to uh, to contact me and uh, and yeah share with me the the documents and output uh, of this project and yeah thank you very much again for the invitation and uh, yeah it's a pleasure to meeting everyone uh, online at this format although i would prefer to travel to armenia and meet you <laughs> in person <laughs> Well, hopefully, but maybe possible in a few more months, yes. Yes, concerning the project, after each of the five modules, we plan to prepare a policy paper with a set of recommendations. Uh, it will be in Armenian, but uh, I may share a summary in English, perhaps, already after this first module. So we have two more events with Slovak and Hungarian experts and then we are going to prepare that paper. And later on, we'll have such recommendations concerning the, the remaining four modules of the program as well. Uh, so let me thank you again and thank the European Institute for European Policy for help with organizing this event and for entire partnership within the program and uh, I hope we will remain in contact with the participants as well and uh, with the audience and I guess we got more people following online than participating in the meeting itself so uh, let's stay in contact and continue work to some mutual benefits and uh, for the participants and for those listening now, uh, we have another event on Friday at 11 a.m. in Yerevan, 9 a.m. in Visegrad countries, with a presentation by Professor Alexander Duleba, who has been working for years at the Slovak Foreign Policy Association. And we invite you to join that discussion as well. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Have a nice evening and hope to see you soon at some other events. Thank you. Goodbye.